I was nearing the end of my shift when I spotted her. It was late, the kind of late where the roads seemed deserted, and the street lights cast long, eerie shadows across the pavement. My eyes were heavy, but the sight of a young girl standing alone at the side of a quiet road jolted me awake. She couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 years old, her pale face illuminated by the dim glow of a flickering lamppost. She was barefoot, wearing a thin, white dress, the kind that didn't belong in the chilly autumn night. I slowed my car, an uneasy feeling creeping up my spine. There was no one around, no houses nearby, and certainly no reason for a child to be out here at this hour. Against my better judgment, I pulled over, rolling down the passenger window. Are you okay? I asked, my voice sounding strange in the stillness of the night. The girl said nothing, but she nodded slightly, her eyes fixed on the ground. After a few moments, she quietly opened the back door and slipped into the seat behind me. She moved with an unnatural grace, almost gliding into place. Where are you headed? I asked, glancing at her in the rearview mirror. Her face was expressionless, her eyes dull as if she hadn't slept in days. For a moment, I considered asking if she was lost or if her parents were nearby, but something about the way she stared out the window made me hesitate. I just want to go home, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Okay, I replied, frowning slightly. Can you tell me your address? There was no response. I looked back at her again, but she just sat there, staring ahead, her tiny hands folded neatly in her lap. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, but I forced myself to remain calm. Maybe she was scared or in shock. Maybe something bad had happened. I started driving, assuming she lived somewhere nearby. After all, this was a small town, and there weren't many places she could be from. The silence between us grew heavier with each passing minute, broken only by the hum of the engine. Every so often, I'd glance in the rearview mirror to check on her, but she remained eerily still. The road stretched on, dark and empty, with only the occasional passing car or streetlight to break the monotony. After a few minutes, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I turned my head to ask her again for her address, but my heart nearly stopped when I saw that the back seat was empty. I slammed on the brakes, the car screeching to a halt in the middle of the road. My chest tightened, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I twisted around in my seat, scanning the back seat in disbelief. She was gone. Vanished. I blinked rapidly, rubbing my eyes, thinking maybe the exhaustion was playing tricks on me. But no, she was just... gone. My hands trembled on the steering wheel, my mind racing to make sense of what had just happened. Had I imagined the whole thing? Was I losing it? I needed to get help. Without thinking, I turned the car around and sped towards the police station, my pulse racing. The streets felt darker, the air heavier. I couldn't shake the image of that girl, the way she had looked, so lost, so vulnerable. And now she was gone. Disappeared into thin air. When I reached the station, I stumbled inside, my heart still pounding in my chest. The officers on duty glanced up at me, concerned. I must have looked like a madman, wild-eyed and frantic. I, I picked up this girl. I stammered. She was standing on the side of the road, and, and then she just disappeared. She asked me to take her home, but, but she wasn't there. She's gone. You have to help me. The officer nearest to me stood up, frowning deeply. Calm down, sir. Let's take this from the beginning. I did my best to explain the situation, recounting every detail, how she had appeared out of nowhere, how she had climbed into my car, and how she had vanished without a trace. The officer listened quietly, exchanging a glance with his colleague before standing up and gesturing for me to follow him into a back office. Can you describe the girl? He asked as we sat down. I nodded, feeling a lump form in my throat. She was young, maybe 10 or 11, pale skin, long brown hair, she was wearing a white dress, and she looked scared, lost. The officer's expression darkened. He leaned back in his chair, his fingers steepled in front of him as he studied me closely. And you said she asked to go home? Yes, I replied. But when I asked her for the address, she didn't say anything. She just disappeared. There was a long, tense silence. The officer sighed heavily and pulled a file from his desk drawer, flipping it open and sliding it across the table toward me. My stomach churned as I looked down at the photograph inside. It was her. The same girl. That's her, I whispered, my voice barely a breath. The officer nodded grimly. 
Her name was Emily. She went missing three years ago. Last seen getting into a taxi late at night, not far from where you picked her up. My blood ran cold. Missing? He hesitated before speaking again, his voice low. She was never found. There were rumors. People said they'd seen her, standing by the side of the road late at night, just like you did. But by the time anyone stopped to help, she was gone. Just like that. I stared at the photo, my mind racing. This couldn't be real. How could a girl who'd been missing for three years just appear out of nowhere and then vanish again? We've had reports like yours before, the officer continued, his voice steady but grim. It's always the same. Someone picks her up, tries to take her home, but she disappears. No one knows why or how. I swallowed hard, my throat dry. So what do I do now? The officer closed the file, his expression unreadable. There's nothing you can do. She's been missing for years, and no one's ever been able to bring her back. But if you see her again, if anyone does, just remember that she's trying to find her way home, wherever that is. I left the station in a daze, the officer's words echoing in my mind. The streets outside felt even darker now, the shadows deeper, more menacing. I couldn't stop thinking about Emily, about the way she had looked at me, her eyes hollow and sad. As I drove back home, my hands still shaking, I couldn't shake the feeling that she was still out there, wandering the roads, searching for something or someone. And I knew, deep down, that I would never forget her face. But as the days went on, I realized something even more terrifying. Late at night, when the roads were quiet and the air was still, I'd sometimes glance in the rearview mirror. And every now and then, I'd catch a glimpse of a figure in the back seat. A small, pale figure with long brown hair staring silently out the window. And I knew she wasn't done with me yet. I've been driving a taxi for 10 years now. I know every alley, every shortcut, every twist and turn in this city. Late night fares are routine for me, and I've heard more strange requests than I can count. But nothing prepared me for what happened last night. It started off like any other shift. The usual mix of half-drunk businessmen, club hoppers, and the occasional lost tourist. I was halfway through my night when I pulled up to a curb to pick up my next fare. A middle-aged woman was standing there, dressed in an old-fashioned black coat, her face partially obscured by a wide-brimmed hat. She climbed in without a word, her movements slow and deliberate. Something about her presence made me uneasy, but I couldn't place why. I adjusted the rearview mirror and caught a glimpse of her face. She was pale, almost sickly, and she stared straight ahead with unnerving intensity. Where to? I asked, trying to keep my voice casual. She didn't respond right away and for a moment I thought she hadn't heard me. Then, in a low, raspy voice, she gave me an address I didn't recognize. I don't think I know that street, I said, glancing back at her. Is it new? She didn't answer, just stared ahead, unblinking. That strange, vacant look in her eyes chilled me. I shifted in my seat, fingers hovering over the GPS screen. I typed in the address she gave me, half expecting it to come up empty, but to my surprise, it registered. I shrugged off the creeping feeling in my gut and started the drive. As we moved deeper into the city, things started to feel wrong. The GPS led me out of the familiar downtown streets and into older, more run-down parts of town. The buildings became dilapidated, the streetlights fewer and farther between, casting weak, flickering beams that barely penetrated the darkness. I kept stealing glances in the mirror, but the woman didn't move. She just kept staring ahead, her hands folded in her lap. Her silence was oppressive, as if the air itself had grown thicker, harder to breathe. The road narrowed, and soon we were on an unfamiliar street lined with old, crumbling houses. The windows were dark, the yards overgrown with weeds. Everything felt deserted, like a place time had forgotten. Here you go, I said, stopping in front of what I assumed was her destination. The house looked abandoned, no lights, no sign of life at all. I couldn't imagine why anyone would want to come here. She turned to me slowly, and for the first time I got a clear look at her face. My stomach twisted. Her skin was sallow, stretched tight over sharp cheekbones. Her eyes were sunken, hollow, as if they hadn't seen daylight in years. You shouldn't have come here, she rasped, her voice barely above a whisper. Before I could respond, she was gone. One second she was sitting in the back seat, and the next, she had simply vanished. I blinked, 
heart hammering in my chest, whipping around to look at the back seat. But it was empty. Cold dread washed over me. My hands gripped the steering wheel so tight, my knuckles turned white. I threw the car into reverse and sped out of there, tires screeching on the pavement. Back at the depot, I couldn't stop thinking about her. I tried to tell myself I was just tired, that I must have imagined it. But it didn't feel like a dream. It felt too real, too wrong. The next morning, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was unfinished. I had to know where I'd taken her. What that place was. I pulled out my phone and opened the GPS history, scrolling back to the address from the night before. My heart skipped a beat when I saw that it was gone. Not just the address, the entire trip. It was as if it had never happened. Determined, I drove back to that part of town. I retraced my route following the turns I remembered, but the street was nowhere to be found. It was like it had vanished, swallowed up by the city. I tried asking around, showing locals the address I had written down. Most just shrugged, saying they'd never heard of it. But there was one old man, sitting outside a rundown shop, who froze when I mentioned it. You shouldn't go looking for that place, he said, his voice low and grave. People don't come back from there. If you're smart, you'll forget about it. His words rattled me, but I couldn't let it go. That night, I found myself driving the same route, searching again for that street. I don't know why. Curiosity, obsession, maybe something darker pulling me back. The air felt colder than usual and the city seemed quieter, as if holding its breath. Finally, after what felt like hours, I saw it. The street. The same crumbling houses. The same eerie silence. My heart pounded as I pulled up in front of the house where I dropped her off. I sat there, staring at it, my palms sweating on the wheel. Something urged me to leave, to drive away and never look back. But I couldn't. I had to know. I got out of the car, my breath fogging in the cold night air. The house loomed before me, dark and silent, its windows like empty eyes watching me. I hesitated at the door, my hand shaking as I reached for the knob. The door creaked open before I could touch it. Inside the air was thick, heavy with the scent of decay. The floorboards groaned under my feet as I stepped inside. The house was empty, but it felt alive, as if it was watching me, waiting for me. Suddenly I heard a soft raspy whisper from the darkness. You shouldn't have come here. My blood ran cold. I spun around, but no one was there. The whisper came again, closer this time, echoing through the empty rooms. The door slammed shut behind me. I ran for it, but the house seemed to shift around me, the walls closing in, trapping me. Panic surged through me as I pounded on the door, screaming for help, but my voice was swallowed by the suffocating darkness. And then, I saw her. The woman from the taxi, standing at the top of the stairs, her hollow eyes locked on mine. You shouldn't have come here, she whispered again, her voice filling my head, drowning out my thoughts. I tried to move, to run, but my legs wouldn't obey. The darkness closed in around me, and the last thing I heard before everything went black was her voice, echoing in my mind, you'll never leave. The next morning, my taxi was found parked on the side of the road. The door was wide open, the engine still running, but I was gone. No one ever saw me again. I've been a taxi driver for years, and while the night shifts aren't for everyone, I've always liked the quiet, the eerie calm that comes over the city after dark. There's a certain rhythm to it, a predictability, but that night, it shattered everything I thought I knew. It was close to midnight, and I'd been about to call it quits when the call came through. The pickup was from a quiet suburban street, the kind where houses stood far apart and the trees loomed over the road like silent sentinels. Normally I wouldn't think twice about a fare from such a place, but something about this one gave me pause. The dispatcher's voice had a strange tone to it, as if he was unsettled himself. But money was money, and I needed the fare. I arrived at the address, and sure enough, the house was dark. No lights on inside, no sign of life. I thought for a second that maybe I'd gotten the address wrong. But then, the front door creaked open, and out shuffled an elderly woman. She was hunched over, frail, and moving painfully slow. In her arms, she carried a small bundle, wrapped tightly in a worn cloth. Even from a distance, I could see her hands trembling as she cradled whatever was in there. Her movements were deliberate, almost as if she were carrying something delicate. 
I rolled down the passenger window as she approached. You called for a taxi? I asked, keeping my voice neutral, though something about her appearance unnerved me. Yes, she whispered, her voice raspy and thin. I need to go across town. Urgently. There was something in her tone that made me hesitate. I couldn't quite place it. Fear, perhaps, or sadness? Either way, I nodded and unlocked the door for her. She slid into the back seat, still clutching the bundle to her chest. The street was dead quiet. No wind, no distant sounds of traffic, just the soft click of her seatbelt and my own breathing. I pulled out, trying to shake the unease that had crept into the car with her. I glanced at her through the rearview mirror, but her face was hidden by the shadows. Only the bundle in her lap was visible, a small rounded shape beneath the cloth. Is everything all right, ma'am? I asked after a few minutes of silence, hoping small talk might ease the tension. She didn't respond for a while, then finally whispered, It's urgent. Please, drive faster. I pressed the gas a little harder, the city's quiet streets whizzing past. I tried to focus on the road, but every now and then I could swear I saw the bundle twitch. At first, I told myself it was just the bumps in the road. But after a few minutes, it happened again this time more deliberate. The bundle moved like something inside was shifting, trying to get out. I glanced in the mirror again, and my heart skipped a beat. The old woman was staring straight ahead, her eyes wide open, but unblinking. Her hands clutched the bundle tighter, her knuckles white with tension. Is, is everything okay back there? I asked, my voice cracking slightly. She didn't answer. She just sat there, silent and stiff, her eyes focused on something far beyond the car, something only she could see. I felt a chill crawl down my spine. I focused back on the road, trying to ignore the creeping dread settling over me. But the more I drove, the more I felt the air grow heavier, colder. The windows fogged slightly despite the heat on, and that bundle in her lap, it kept moving. We finally arrived at the address she'd given me, a house on the far side of town, old and run down. The place looked like it hadn't seen a visitor in years. The lawn was overgrown, and the windows were dark, reflecting nothing but the pale moonlight. There were no lights on inside, no car in the driveway. I turned to her, but she was already moving. She reached into her coat and pulled out a crumpled bill, handing it to me with a trembling hand. Take care of her, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the pounding in my chest. Take care of who? I asked, glancing from her to the bundle in her lap, but when I looked up again, she was gone. The back seat was empty. I blinked, my heart thundering in my ears. The door hadn't opened. There had been no sound of her getting out. She was just… gone. Panic surged through me, and I twisted around in my seat searching the street, the house, nothing. Just the shadows and the stillness of the night. But the bundle was still there, resting on the back seat, unmoving. I hesitated, my hands shaking as I reached back. My fingers brushed the cloth, and I flinched. It was cold, too cold. Swallowing hard, I slowly unwrapped it, my heart pounding so loud I could hear it in my ears. Inside was a doll, an old worn doll, its dress tattered and yellowed with age. Its eyes, two dark, glassy beads, stared up at me with a lifeless gaze. But as I stared at it, those eyes seemed to move, following my every movement. My breath caught in my throat. It was impossible, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the doll was watching me. Not just looking at me, but watching with an intent far beyond anything a lifeless object should possess. I flung the doll back onto the seat and scrambled out of the car, gasping for air. The cold night pressed in around me, but even out there, I couldn't shake the feeling of those eyes on me. I leaned against the car, trying to steady my breathing, to convince myself that I was overreacting. But then I heard it. A faint sound, like a soft childish giggle coming from inside the car. My blood turned to ice. I turned, staring into the back seat, but the doll hadn't moved. It just sat there, staring at me with those black, unblinking eyes. I slammed the door shut, my hands trembling. Whatever was in that bundle, whatever that doll was, I wanted nothing to do with it. I drove away, faster than I'd ever driven before. Not caring about the fare, not caring about anything, but putting distance between me and that house, between me and that thing. But no matter how far I drove, the feeling of those eyes stayed with me, a weight on my chest, a shadow I couldn't shake. 
When I finally got home and parked the car, I sat there for a long time, staring into the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the doll's face staring back at me. It wasn't. But the next morning, when I got back into the car, the bundle was gone. The doll was nowhere to be found. But in its place on the back seat was a single crumpled bill. And written across it, in shaky, spidery handwriting, were three words that chilled me to the bone. Take care of her. I've never driven at night since.